happy. So thank you. Um, so without further ado, and thank you, Laura, for introducing our new members. Welcome to all of our new members. Um, I will ask everyone to please mute if you would, unless you are the featured speaker, which you probably are not statistically. There's only the one. And uh, uh, thank you. And then I would like to introduce Jennifer Bernstein, who is, uh, sorry, I've got my notes covered up, who is the program coordinator for the for Jewish Family and Children's Services. That is not accurate. I'm so sorry. I, that that is an old one. I must. I'm guessing. Um, I will spotlight you then, and I will let you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, talk to us about the effects of the new law. Okay. So thank and you I, very I much for being late. I I must have had the wrong link. I've been trying to get in for the past ten minutes, and it said a oh, meeting yeah. was already in progress. And so I must have had a bad link. So I apologize for being late. Um, I don't, yeah, that's an old bio, but I, I would love to go back to those days when it was a lot easier. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jen Bernstein, and I am the advocacy manager at National Council of Jewish Women St. Louis. And I have been working there since 2016. And I joined the staff after being on the board for several years and being their vice president of advocacy and state policy advocacy chair. So advocacy, advocacy is kind of my life. And for those of you unfamiliar with National Council of Jewish Women, we've been around for over 125 years. Um, I, I don't believe there is a very active section in Kansas City. Um, the Missouri people are mainly in the St. Louis area, so you may not be too familiar with it. Um, we're basically a community service and advocacy organization. And our programs, we really like to tie together the advocacy component. For example, we have a, about 30 closets in local public schools for kids to come get coats, sweatpants, uniforms, anything they need. Um, you know, and we do realize that's a band-aid, but um, that's why we like to work with the legislature and help pass uh, legislation that will, you know, put that kind of thing out of business because we don't want to be a band-aid. We want to make change. So that's really what we're all about. And one of our priority issues is reproductive justice. And as we all know, that issue has been on the forefront lately, unfortunately. Um, and I'm here today to talk about trigger laws. And I know a lot of people are probably familiar and have heard that term before. Um, but basically, tri trigger laws were put into effect by about 13 states that have a very strong anti-abortion bent in their legislatures. And they passed laws that would make abortion illegal if and when Roe versus Wade was overturned. Um, in some states like Missouri, it was immediate. In some states, it took 30 days, you know, whatever. But they were basically all the hostile states wanted this law into effect when, if and when Roe v. Wade was overturned. Um, our legislature is obviously still very hostile to reproductive justice issues and abortion, abortion especially, but not just abortion. Um, we all know abortion is now illegal in Missouri, except for when the life of the mother is in danger. And unfortunately, we've heard of several cases where people have been put in grave danger because let's say they go to the hospital for an ectopic pregnancy. We all know that that is not something where a fetus is viable or if it's even a fetus yet. And it puts the pregnant person's life in grave, grave danger. And we've heard so many stories about, even at hospitals that are not hostile to abortion, that they have to go through all sorts of legal loopholes. They have to go before an ethics board. They have to do this, they have to do that. And it puts people's lives in danger and it's not okay. And it's terrifying. Um, for all intents and purposes though, in Missouri, and you all probably know about this on the, on the Kansas City side because you have Kansas where abortion is legal. Um, abortion has basically been illegal in Missouri for a long time now, not technically, but really it has been they instituted the 72 hour waiting period. So let's say you live in Cape Girardeau and you have a full-time job and you aren't, you know, you don't have vacation time. You have to go up to, to St. Louis, get um, an exam where they probably try to talk you out of it or a crisis pregnancy center sees you going into Planned Parenthood and tries to hook you over to their thing to talk you out of the, um, out of the procedure. 
And then once you decide to have the procedure, you have to wait 72 hours. So do you go back home? Do you stay up here? Do you miss three days of work? So they make they made it as difficult as possible for someone to access an abortion. So most of the people on this side of the state have been going to Illinois already. Um, there are two clinics right across the river. There's a Planned Parenthood clinic. And there's also Hope Clinic, which is an independent clinic. So I imagine there's probably something similar over on the Kansas side where people have been going there instead of trying to access. Um, and, and there is no abortion clinic in the, on the Kansas side of Missouri, on the Kansas City side of Missouri anyway. Um, the Planned Parenthood in St. Louis was the only abortion clinic for the longest time. Um, so very few abortions were performed in Missouri over the past few years. So now, not only are the Illinois clinics seeing patients from Missouri because of the trigger laws, but they're also seeing a huge influx of patients from other states, even as far away as Texas. And we've heard, heard, all heard about the Texas laws. So they're starting to see a huge influx of people from other states too, and they are just being overrun. Um, the full effects of the state's ban and its legal ramifications are yet to be seen and our work is far from over. Um, and, and I know that the other speaker is gonna talk about from the Jewish perspective, because in Judaism, real briefly, um, we just have a different view than the, the overriding Christian perspective. And a lot of Jewish organizations like ours, there are some synagogues in Florida we're talking about maybe bringing up a lawsuit because it violates the establishment clause that one religion won't be imposed you know, the views of one religion won't be imposed on all over on all others. We've been considering a lawsuit, but that takes a while, obviously. And we don't know how successful it will be in Missouri. Um, so clinics have been preparing by shoring up their staff and expanding physically, but you know, health workers at these facilities also said it's going to be harder for patients to make an appointment because they're being overrun by all of these people from other states and they have to travel so far on, and everything. So in Illinois, clinic workers are advocating for expanding who can perform surgical procedures. Right now it's only medical doctors, but they are um, advocating to allow nurse practitioners to do that uh, procedure as well. Um, so that would be something that's a little hopeful. And Illinois is probably a lot more open to it than many other states. Um, the Missouri trigger law does not affect, this is really important because there's been a lot of misinformation out there um, and it's easy to get caught up in that. But right now the trigger law does not affect our access to birth control or the plan B pill. Now that doesn't mean it won't eventually because our legislature not only is hostile to abortion, it's very hostile to birth control. Um, a few years back, a couple of years back, they were trying to get the Medicaid um, FSA money to be distributed to Missourians. And the thing that was holding it up was the uh, fact that people could use that money for birth control pills. It's none of anyone's business. Um, an overwhelming majority of people support access to birth control. Um, and so the, it's just a way for people to have control over our bodies. Um, Plan B is also not immediately affected by the state's trigger law. Um, and, and the difference between plan B and birth control, um, you know, again, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, birth control, you know, is different. Plan B helps a per keeps a person from releasing an um from releasing an egg and it keeps the egg from being fertilized um or implanting in the uterus. So it's used in more of an emergency situation. Let's say a man and woman have sex and the man's condom breaks and they're not really worried about it, but just in case you might go get a plan B or God forbid, if there's a sexual assault or something like that, um, you know, it's, you can still get them at pharmacies. They're still perfectly legal. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Unfortunately, there are some gatekeeping pharmacists out there. We've heard stories of people who they won't, they won't fill a prescription of even birth control pills because of their ideological beliefs. Um, they won't give someone a lupus medication because they see it as an abortive patient. So people are inserting their ideologies and not upholding their medical or um, you know whatever their overseeing, overseeing committee's pr general practices are. So you hear about that all the time, especially with other medications that can be seen as an abortifacient. 
So it's, it's really getting scary out there. Um, so this is, you know, as Roe versus Wade established the right to privacy, experts have warned that overturning this decision could eventually have ramifications for the availability of birth control and for Plan B and other emergency contraception. Um, so we've been advocate, we, we in, in NCJW do a lot of advocacy work in the legislative um, session. And for years now, we've been trying to get a bill passed, which would require insurance companies to cover 12 months of uninterrupted birth control pills, which means that let's say, and, and you know, those of us who have been on the birth control pill can attest to this. Sometimes you just don't feel like going to pick it up at the pharmacy that day, or you forget, or you're too busy or whatever. And oops, you forgot to take your pill that day and you're pregnant. So we want people to, you know, and it's always mind boggling. And I'm, I know I'm not, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but the people who are so dead set against abortion are not willing to even entertain the idea of comprehensive sex education, of birth control access, of anything like that, which would prevent abortions. Um, a study, there was a similar law passed in Colorado a few years ago where they allow for the uninterrupted, uninterrupted prescriptions of birth control pills and abortions have gone down significantly. It's also kept people in school. It's also kept people on, on the job. So it's a win-win for everyone concerned, whether you are pro-choice or you're not pro-choice. So it's it's really frustrating when you're dealing with a group of legislators who are so stuck in their ways and they have no interest in talking to you about real, real like, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? I apologize. Just, you know, just, it just makes sense. So it, it's just really frustrating. Um, but again, bottom line, the trigger laws were designed to make abortion illegal in any states that have them. And 13, including Missouri, do have them. Um, last thing I'm going to talk about is that a lot of people think, oh, Missouri is one of those states where people are just, everyone's just hostile to abortion and abortion rights. And it's just what we have to do. It's what we have to deal with. We live here. Um, Abortion, 69% of Missourians oppose any sort of government forcing people to be pregnant and give birth. So an overwhelming majority of us do not want this to be illegal. Um, and there are probably people who are in a gray area who maybe will say, oh, you know, maybe in the case of, ra case of rape or incest or in the case of the health of the mother, fine. But there, there, you know, an overwhelming number of people do not want it to be illegal for any reason. Um, and it's very safe compared to pregnancy and childbirth. And a lot of our legislators will try to argue that it's not safe. I was in a hearing a few years ago where Senator Rick Bratton tried to claim that 50,000 women died of abortions in the previous year, which was just completely out of thin air. Um, you know, so that they just go way, way beyond the pale. Um, so what you can do is just keep calling your legislators. If you have a friendly legislator, thank them. They don't hear from us often enough. If you're lucky to live in a friendly district, um, they're always hearing from people who are, um, you know, complaining about something. But if you call and give, you know, say thank you for fighting for this, they're going to be even more motivated to fight harder. And if you're in an unfriendly district, call them, let them know you're out there, even if you don't think you can change your mind on any, anything, which you probably can't. Um, you know, make sure that you, they know that you're out there. And obviously, you know, as the League of Women Voters, elect candidates that support your views. And I know we're a 501c3 too, so we, but, you know, just, um, and that's about it, I think. Does, does that cover yeah. basically what you were looking for? Yeah, and I, you know, normally when we have a couple of speakers, we'll, we'll wait for questions till the end, but okay. I think because Bob's story is so personal, I think we'll actually uh, change that for this meeting. And, ask you some questions because sure. you're, you were kind of our expert on how this law is playing out how, and the sort of technical issues. So I see we already have one hand up and um, sure. I also have a question. Absolutely. Um, and actually I have a couple of questions, but the first one is you had mentioned, be sure to call your legislators and to advocate for um, the position that we take, which is that um, it's up to the woman to decide it's between a woman and her, and her doctor. It's, right. it's a private issue. Um, 
So we do have a legislative action committee that watches legislation. And of course, we're not in session right now, but um, we will be in January and they'll start pre-filing bills in December. Are there any bills that you've heard some that, you know, that have been maybe introduced over and over again? Is there something yeah. that we should be watching for? The, the biggest one I would be watching for is anything that Mary Elizabeth Coleman does. Um, she has become, because she listens to Lizzo, so she's cool. So she's become, she was even in a Washington Post article. She is a, um, a state, she's going to be a state senator. I can't imagine, she won her, her primary, and I don't think she has a, um, another, like an opponent that's viable. Um, and she is kind of the poster child of the new, the new era of anti-abortion. And she, her big thing is to make it illegal to transport people to other states to have the procedure. So she will want to make it illegal for anyone to drive someone on to, or, or to go yourself to Illinois or to Kansas to have an abortion. Um, that's a big one. Um, they're also going to try to go after any sort of funding. So NCJW, for example, we um, just started a partnership with the two clinics in Illinois where we're going to do something similar to our kids' community closets that we have in schools where we're gonna provide um, just stuff that people can have post-procedure, whether they need um, you know, period products, whether they need diapers, whether they need an outfit. If they're coming from Texas and they're driving all night, they want a new you know, pair, pair of sweats. Um, so just stuff that they can just take you know, free of charge. Um, but we have to make sure we're gonna open up a bank account in Illinois because if, if something like this passes, any money that's transferred from Missouri could be, it could affect, you know, our 501c3 status. It could affect, you know, if they could come after us, they could come and sue us. So things like that. I mean, there's, they're not done yet, but that's the biggest one. Okay. And question. I don't know what you all use. If you all use something like Fast Democracy or GovWatch. We, um, uh, for, we have a combination of things that we use and then okay. we, and then we actually use us. Oh, great. Yeah, you guys are awesome. So um, for anyone who might want to look on their, you know, on their own time, we highly recommend Fast Democracy. It's just, I think, fastdemocracy.com or just Google Fast Democracy. And what you can do, and it, you can make up a free account. We have a professional account and it's much more in the weeds, but you don't really need that. Um, and you just put in a category, let's say it's abortion, let's say it's LGBTQ or, you know, whatever, farming, anything. Um, you put that in and anytime a bill, um, it will give you all of the bills in that, that have been pre-filed or filed and it will, you know, email you anytime there's movement on that bill. So it's, it's, it's really easy. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. All right. A uh, question from Laura Marcus Mountjoy. Um, I had been reading about the fact that because the majority of Missourians, just as the majority of Americans in general right. really do want access to abortion, that states are now um, working on using their citizen initiative um, um, powers and the fact that especially after the, um, my husband's word that he wishes would leave our vocabulary, but the unprecedented outcome of the amendment in Kansas that there's a very good chance that we can start a citizen initiative petition in Missouri to make access to abortion um, available. And um, I, that's obvious why our legislature is trying to change the parameters for the citizens initiative uh, process. So is there any movement from any groups um, in in starting that process that could maybe end up on the ballot, say in 2024? Yeah, we are um, in talks with Pro-Choice Missouri, Planned Parenthood, some of the other organizations to see, you know, we're kind of in the uh, needs assessment phase or, you know, whatever you would call it, to, to, to the feasibility kind of thing. But yeah, as you mentioned, the legislature is chipping away um, what, what that new amendment does is makes it even harder to get an initiative on the ballot. You have to have like an even higher majority of signatures and, you know, and all of the congressional districts have to agree and, you know, all sorts of stuff. So, you know, again, it's the Missouri legislature at work, but yes, we are working on possibly doing that. 
Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. Reva, you have a question. You're on mute. Yep. Um, thanks, Jen. Um, I want to address what you talked about pharmacies, a pharmacist refusing to fill up legal prescription. What can you do about that? Can you report them? Because if they're not going to fulfill their role as a secular, um, right. I don't care what the religious uh, idea is, if they are working in a public uh, Drug uh, pharmacy as a pharmacist, there is their legal duty to do that. Yeah. So, can you report them, and how, what can you do about that? I would, I would absolutely report them. Go to the media, go to the hires up. Like, it, if it's a, you know, I'm not saying it happened at Walgreens, but if it happened at Walgreens, obviously, like in a Catholic hospital, that's a different story. But right. like at a Walgreens or CVS or Target or whatever, um, yeah, absolutely, I would do that and go to the media and blast it all over social media. But, you know, there's another side to that, too, because then the pharmacist is going to become a martyr at, for their cause. Um, and, you, you know, again, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but they're going to get a kick out of that. Well, but, you know, they say that about Trump, too. And I think right. that um, they say that about all this, that, you know, if you if you do this, this is going to happen. And I thought, well, if we don't do it, what is right. going to happen? And you, I think you still the, definitely have to do. it. Right. I think if we don't keep these people um according to the law if we don't prosecute them then we're going to be in a, in a huge problem down the line right and it's just sickening that people are doing this and people are refusing to give medicine to someone who's of childbearing age like a lupus medication because it could possibly be an abortifacient you don't know if this person has had their tubes tied or right. you know doesn't want children and is figure that you know it's it's none of anyone's damn business yeah so okay thank you i, I appreciate sure. that sure yeah that was one of my questions too. Thank you, okay. Reva. Um, so you you talked about what we could do as individuals mm -hmm. that we can uh, contact our legislators. We can um, you know weigh in that way. What can we as an organization do? Because we have a position on uh, reproductive rights, and yeah. so as an organization, we care very much about this. What what can we do? I mean, keep talking about it. Keep using your social media. Using your platform. Um, you know, anytime there's something in Jeff City going on, go down and, and testify, you know, mobilize your your members to do the same. Um, you know, it, it's hard because, you know, a lot of times when we go down there, we, we're the ones, there's maybe one person testifying on the other side and there's 20 of us down there, but then they rush us out of the room. Mm -hmm. Or there are some people who are very, you, NCJW tends to take a more, um, and, and this is kind of done by design with some of our coalition partners, but we tend to take a more moderate stance where some of our coalition partners will have signs that say F abortion bans, and they will be loud. We will be the quote unquote adults in the room. And, and, and again, we do that by design, but sometimes it can really impact how the day goes. But, you know, be always be respectful and stuff when you're down there. And again, this is not something that you all don't already know. But I think that's the, you know, mo just mobilize your members to call, to knock doors for candidates if, you know, they happen to support them um, to vote. We don't I get to do, we, we don't get to do that. I have to say, yeah. we don't get to okay. do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, personally, yeah, we people can't can knock doors, but <laughs> yeah. not as an organization. Right, um, right. Uh, well, but as a follow-up, how do, how do we get in, uh, get the information that your organization puts out do you have a mailing list do you have a website we do. That we could go um, to? We, if you'd like I, anybody can email me and i'll put my email in the chat we do um i'm gonna just type that up really quick because i can't type in i can't type talk and talk at the same time either so i'll vamp while you talk <laughs> because really i 100 percent get it <laughs> and uh okay. i couldn't even do that when i was a school teacher <laughs> on the board <laughs> So we um we put out something every Monday called Five Ways to Advocate that a lot of times we'll have this will be the issue, but other other issues that we cover too, whether it's LGBTQ plus, whether it's voting. Um, so stuff, I, I mean, I imagine our priorities align very similarly. So if there's something, if there's a bill saying we need you to call Representative Smith on Tuesday because they're voting on this on Wednesday. Here's here's how to do that. So if, if you want to sign up for that, I'd be happy to put you on the list. I won't put you on any other list. Don't worry about it. Um, but just shoot me an email and I'm happy to do that. That's how we do it. Or we'll do just a dedicated e-blast 
um, we have a constant contact account that we use. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we'll make phone calls if it's that urgent. And do you have a we website need, we as well? To, to call so-and-so about this. Um, we have a, a database where we have people filed by legislative district too. So that's helpful. You know, so we, we don't have many members, but we do have some members like in Mary Elizabeth Coleman's district. And if there's something especially egregious, we'll say, you know, give her a call and say, you live in her district. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. All right, Mary Lindsay, you have a question. Yeah, I, I've i only been aware of one real rally over here in Kansas City um, on this topic, and it was it was pretty early on. Um, and and if other people over here know of others that somehow I just didn't hear about, please let me know. But I've been surprised that there haven't been more. And um, and I'm I'm wondering if you think something like that is is a helpful thing. Now, obviously, if you don't have a if you only have a tiny rally, it right. probably is more negative than positive. But um, um, what do you do over there in St. Louis? Are you having big? There have been a couple rallies. I'm myself, and this is me, you know, nobody has to think the same as me. I kind of think rallies are a little self-serving and don't do a lot, um, especially when they're not directed solely at someone. Now, if you are, if, if, if there's something going on, let's say in Jeff City and there's a big rally, I think that's different. But I think if you're just, I mean, we had a rally right after Roe was overturned at Planned Parenthood and it was all people, all supporters. And yeah, I guess the news was there because they, they had a speaker, but you know, I, I don't really feel like it did much. I think that you know, much more important is to educate people about crisis pregnancy centers. Um, you know, go be a clinic escort if you can. Be a legal observer. That's something, and I and I imagine they probably have that. That that's a little, you know, if you're a little scared to be a clinic escort, which I totally understand. Um, you can be a legal observer where you sit in your car and you kind of keep tally of anyone who's trying to interrupt someone going in and make sure that they're not being inappropriate. And then they have documentation of that if they ever need to go to, to you know, higher, you know, higher up for that. Um, so I think those are tend to be a little more effective. I think, you know, a big rally, like, you know, a march in DC, you know, or a big march in Jeff City, that's something different. But, you know, the rally we all went to was kind of to make ourselves feel better. And, and there's value to that too. How do you coordinate uh, if you decide you do want to go and volunteer as an escort or you mm -hmm. want to be a legal observer, how do, do you coordinate with the clinic to do that? Wait, some, sometimes it's, I guess it depends with us. We coordinate through Pro-Choice Missouri, which used to be NARAL. So I don't know if you have a similar chapter there. So they might do that or it might be the clinic themselves. Um, they, um, yeah, it, it really depends. Okay. Although it would be probably Pro-Choice Kansas because- we don't yeah. have one. I mean, we would have to cross the line to help. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Two more questions. Reva, we'll start with you. This is just a quick comment on what Mary said about rallies. And I think that they can be great, but if you have a rally in Kansas City and St. Louis, all that says is, oh, look at those Democrats in St. Louis and Kansas City. Right. Now, if you have a rally in a rural area, yeah, maybe that would make a difference. Very good point. Um, but I think if you're going to do a rally, it's got to be in areas where people don't think there's support for this. That's yeah. just my. That's a my very point. good point. Very good point. All right, Bob. Um, on that topic, um, it was about a month ago, um, before the actually before the election, uh, a local group um, put forth a cry for. Uh, put forth a rally, and our League of Women Voters joined, uh, but we did not sponsor it. It was a community group, and it was held downtown by the community center and had an excellent turnout. I would guess more than 200 people showed up. The organizer, we learned later, was a uh, faculty member in a Catholic school here. She was fired because she had organized the event. 
but uh, it was a very successful event. I got to say, good turnout. So I, I, that came to mind uh, when you brought up, brought up that topic. Hmm. I, I'm impressed with, with that turnout. Yeah. Uh, Bob is actually from my hometown, so it's not, uh, he actually lives in my hometown, uh, which is not that big a city. So that's a that's a really good turnout. Um, the population, is there, is about, population is about twenty five thousand. Yeah, uh, is that teacher is that teacher uh, doing anything, taking any legal action? At this point, I don't know. Uh, have, have not. It's not been made public if she is, but I would hope so. Yeah, I hope so too. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Bernstein? All right, boy, thank you for You're just welcome. a wealth of information. That was so um, that was so helpful. I hope you'll thank stick you around. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled yeah. to be here. Yeah, please stick around if you if you would like yeah, to. Absolutely. And uh, we may have some questions again that pop up at the end. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I am going to spotlight Bob Grover. Um, Bob, as I said, is from Emporia, Kansas, my hometown. And he is Professor Emeritus of, of at Emporia State um, in the School of Library Science and is also a co-author of a column for the Emporia Gazette, which happens to have as its other co-author um, our own Jim Calvert, who is a member of our league and edits our e-voter. So Bob, um, I know you have a very personal story that you want to share with us because we can talk about all these things sort of in statistics and um, in uh, you know a little bit distanced terms, but but these are real people affected by the laws that are made and real stories and real feelings. So Bob, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, and I want to thank Heather and. Lisa, for uh, who are responsible for this event and for all those who attended. And I thank Jen for a very informative presentation just now. Um, I'm doing this, this is the first time I've talked to a group um, like this because uh, my topic is so personal. And uh, except for family and very close friends, I didn't go public with this story until uh, Jim Calvert and I, um, writing our column, uh, I decided I would go public with my story. And he proved it and made some comments, and I thank Jim for that. Um, indeed, re reproductive rights uh, is an important topic in this country, and undoubtedly will continue to be. And I commend this organization for exploring this vital issue because a woman's rights are at stake. Now my topic today is abortion. An abortion decision is never easy. And it's not simple, as one might suspect, hearing the rhetoric from uh, those who, oppose to, who are opposed to abortion. Um, abortion discussions usually do not include the lasting emotional and psychological impact of a decision about abortion. And very seldom do we hear the perspective of the father. So today I'm going to share my experience with an abortion decision in my life uh, more than 50 years ago. In 1970, my wife, Susan, and I had been uh, married nearly four years. And we moved from LaPorte, Indiana to a Chicago suburb. I had taken a job the school librarian at Oak Park River Forest High School, Oak Park, Illinois. We bought our first home in Oak Park and we were getting settled when we learned that Susan was pregnant. Well, of course, we were very happy. We began planning for our first child's arrival. And one of the first things we did was uh, we made an appointment with uh, an obstetrician to be sure that we were preparing for a healthy birth. We also had some concerns about Susan's health during the pregnancy because she had made it known to me early on in our dating that she had type one diabetes, 
which I knew nothing about, nothing. But I was learning <laughs> during the three, uh, three years up to that point that we've been married. And diabetes was diagnosed when she was five years old. And since that time, I've taken daily insulin sh uh, doses, shots. So during our first meeting with the obstetrician, he gave her a careful exam, reviewed her medical records, asked several questions, and gave us his assessment. He said to us, given your, Susan's condition, with type 1 diabetes, I must say that either you, Susan, or both you and the baby may not I still get so <laughs> emotional. I was afraid this would happen. Make it through the pregnancy. He didn't recommend an abortion, but he made, made it very clear the uncertainty of a healthy birth. As you might expect, we were shocked by the doctor's forecast. And I remember leaving the office, walking to our car, and sitting there so stunned that we couldn't talk for several minutes. We'd been so happy thinking about a baby, planning for its birth. And now we were facing a very uncertain and complicated pregnancy. Even now, as I recall this time, I have some feelings of uncertainty and anguish. Much less intense, of course, but I still choke up sometimes when I think about it. So over the next days, after we had that appointment with our obstetrician, we discussed the options. And one was a, an abortion, which was legal in Illinois in 1970. And the other course was to proceed with the hope that a healthy child would be born and my wife would recover fully following the birth. Well, she was very excited about having a child and wanted to proceed with the pregnancy. And it was my feeling that and still is my feeling today that it's a woman's prerogative because her life is at stake. It is her body. I expressed my concern for her health, but agreed that if she wanted to move forward, we would do so together because I also wanted a child. At this point, we were nearing the fourth month of pregnancy, and we continued planning for the arrival by painting the nursery, buying a crib, even buying some baby clothes. She was looking pregnant and feeling well to this point. We were looking forward to the baby's arrival. So each month we had scheduled an appointment with our obstetrician and the reports were positive until late in the sixth month. And during that exam, the doctor informed us that the fetus had no heartbeat. And once again, uh, we were emotionally jolted. We had not let ourselves think about losing this child. Our dream of parenthood suddenly collapsed. And I still can recall the shock that we both felt that day. And some of the pain is still there, 52 years later. So we followed the doctor's advice to allow a natural birth, which occurred two months later. And we could have had an abortion at that time, too. Now I question the obstetrician's decision to carry the fetus to, to its natural birth, but we did not question it at the time. We were both young. I was 27, my wife was 30, and uh, we just didn't consider uh, that choice, and the emotional burden was quite heavy. When the fetus was born, we arranged to meet with a priest to have the fetus interred at a cemetery in my hometown, the court. And I have visited that grave several times. And Susan is also buried in that same secretary, cemetery. Well, Susan recovered from the birth and we resumed our lives, but her health slowly deteriorated. She was hospitalized for a week during the second year following the birth. And uh, then on Mother's Day, 1973, uh, we, we visited my parents. Uh, we returned home after a short visit because Susan was not feeling well. The next day, I took her to our physician. 
referred to us, who referred us to a Chicago hospital where she was admitted. She was very ill and not able to return to our home. And uh, she died two months later in July of 1972. The obstetrician's forecast was right. Both mother and child did not survive. The pain I still feel is that loss of two uh, loves in my life. Although the child was not born, she had been part of our lives for a short time and we were looking forward to a life as a family. It was very lonely after Susan's death. And in retrospect, I started dating too soon. I wanted to fill the void, I was so lonely. I remarried and ended that marriage after 11 years of divorce. A few years later, a third marriage ended in divorce. And after that second divorce, I decided to seek counseling, which I should have done immediately after Susan's death. I learned during that counseling that I had not grieved my first wife's death. And nearly four years of counseling enabled my emotional recovery from the loss of my first wife and child. So a question still remains in my mind. What if we had had an abortion? It would have grieved the loss of our baby as we did later. The emotions would have been similar. But my wife's life might have been extended, maybe a few years, maybe many years. So I still ask myself, did we make the right decision? Now I return to the point I made earlier, the choice to have an abortion is very emotional for the couple involved. And it's often not discussed. The woman may ponder how her life would be different had she given birth. The father may also feel anxiety as I did and have. Abortion is often discussed with little attention to the stress and emotions that, emotions that accompany an abortion decision and whether or not an abortion is elected, the decision has a lasting impact on the lives of parents and family. Indeed, an abortion is never easy, and it's not simple, and the raw emotions are likely to remain with the couple the remainder of their lives, as they have with me. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts and feelings with you today. Thank you so much, Bob. And we are so sorry for your losses. It's it's heartbreaking. Your story is heartbreaking. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I will take you off spotlight. I, I actually have a follow-up question for Jen um, after that story. So Jen, Bob and his wife, Sue, Susan, had to make a decision after the, their child was no longer had a heartbeat. They had to make a decision to carry that uh, child to its natural birth or to uh, have an abortion. Is that choice an option for the residents of Missouri now? It, it really depends. Um, as I mentioned before, things have to go through committees and ethics committees and legal, and it might be too late by the time it happens. I, you know, I, it, these are the kinds of stories that, that legislators don't even think about. And they, you know, think that people who are getting later term, quote unquote, later term abortions are doing it because they just don't want to have a baby. It's stories like this are the reason people are doing it because either the baby doesn't have a chance 
or the life of the mother's in danger. And, and they say that with the new law that, or, you, you know, in the new reality that the mother's life, if, if her life is in danger, that she'll be taken care of, but we don't know that for sure. And would they have considered her life to be in danger? Probably not. And when it clearly not, was. Because it's not immediate. It has to be, I think for now it has to be an immediate danger. So you have to be, you know, pretty much crashing. Um, yeah, it's, it's astonishing. So do stories like these told in testimony to legislators make a difference? Uh, I, I think so. I think so. I think especially from someone like Bob, um, who looks like the legislature, who, you know, is, and I hate, I hate saying this, but he's a, he's a white male, you know, and they, and, and, and they're likely more to listen to, to someone like Bob. Hmm. So that might be one way that we could advocate for our position would be yeah. to, to ask around to see if we have right members with stories to see if we have members who would be willing to share personal experiences and particularly yeah. people I, it's so profoundly sad and powerful yeah and yeah. and bob thank you yeah. I, it's, I don't even know what to say thank you i know thank you and yes uh, i just have a question also jen I, or, or for anybody who can answer this if you're a lawyer okay so let's say you know you say jen they have to just uh, jump through so many hoops. And so what happens if somebody dies while this is going on? I mean, are they concerned about lawsuits from these people from like a father whose wife dies because they, you know, because of this uh, health issue that they say they have to go through all these channels. And like you said, it could be too late. And if it's too late and she dies, is that, I mean, to me, that sounds like a grounds for a lawsuit. I don't know if they're think yeah. about that or not. I think they're more scared of, of the legislature coming after them by violating um, the law than they are with a, you know, maybe a malpractice suit. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, again, I'm not a legal expert, so I'm not a lawyer. I don't know the answer to that. Well, could the, could the couple sue the state for that law? They could, but don't know if they'll want, you know. Yeah, I, that that's something that's going to be interesting to see down the line. I mean, interesting, obviously, because it's it's not interesting because it's, it, it would be a terrible tragedy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think everyone knows what I mean. Mm -hmm. Do you. Uh, so. Uh, it seems to, to me that there's been, you know, there was, it was such a shock to have the Dobbs decision come down. Uh, although we'd seen it coming for years. So it, it was a, you know, a shock and not a shock at the same time. Uh, and then there was so much focus on Kansas and what was going on with the amendment in Kansas. And then, then that amendment, you know, went down. Um, do you think that, that much of the um, abortion access and uh, reproductive freedom energy is maybe being funneled into partisan politics because I don't it doesn't feel like there's as much energy as I might have expected after a ruling like Dobbs. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I don't know if it's maybe because we're not in session that that's happening. I, I know that a lot of people are running on, you know, they, they ran in their primaries, who's the more pro-choice candidate. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will be when, when the election comes, I think that will be a big issue. Um, but yeah, I think once the legislative session is, is back in, I think you'll see more of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? This is a, this has been a really, such a serious topic. Um, I, you know, I'm, I try to be a little bit of a clown and lighten the mood for a lot of our meetings because we have so much hard work to do. And it just feels sometimes like we get defeated 
and we have to keep some humor about it but um but I'm afraid I don't have that for today. Mm -hmm. So Reva, did you, you had your hand up? Yeah, just to comment on uh, on that, what you had asked, Anne. And, uh, you know, I've been look, reading lately, Mary Lindsay told me this too, that now they're saying that people are, one of the biggest issues now for election is democracy, that they're concerned about, people are concerned about rights. And so I think um, the reproductive rights part of that is going to also be a big part of that. I mean, not just the reproductive, but the fact that they're taking away the right for voting, that they're putting people in office who are going to make decisions about who wins rather than the people. So I, I think that the, the umbrella of democracy is uh, becoming more and more um, important to people. And I think a big part of that is reproductive rights. I think more women are uh, registering to vote. Um, in, 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 you know, there's many, many women registering out of vote, and I think that's one of the reasons. So I'm hoping that that comes under that umbrella. Yeah, I do too. Okay, well, we, uh, we have about a half hour's worth of announcements that I have to make because we have so much going on. So I know it seems like, wow, what a short meeting, but short, but dense really packed with information and emotion. And so before we move on to our sort of businessy part, I just want to just please uh, a round of gratitude for our speakers, uh, Jennifer Bernstein and Bob Grover. Thank you so much for sharing your information and your stories with us. We, we, uh, we appreciate it so much. Thank you. And you are more than welcome to stay and hear about everything our committees are doing and you're also more than welcome to uh go have lunch <laughs> yeah, so. I've, I've actually got to go do another thing but I, I really appreciate you having us today so thank you thank you let, so and much feel free to email me anytime with questions or if you know if you think of someone something at 3 a.m just shoot me an email so yeah thank absolutely you. thank you those are my hours too so thank <laughs> you I, will, ah, I gotta make a joke after thank all you. Thank <laughs> everyone Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Wow. That was, that's powerful stuff. Okay. And now I have a whole bunch of announcements and I may even uh, be less strict about making them all myself because we do have a little bit of time. Um, so uh, if I leave any of your information out, you may jump in and, and add. Uh, and I'm. this is in no particular order, but I want to let everybody know that there are some voter guide vote for one one deadlines coming up that the activation date. So that's the date that all the information is available and we could tell people, all right, go all of us up there. Uh, that date is October 17th and we will be distributing the voter guides, the written voter guides. Uh, the week of October 17th, I did say October 17th first, right? So yeah, both the same day. Uh, it goes live on the 17th and we will distribute them the week of the 17th. Um, Pat, you've got a bullet point that says how members can request voter guides, but I don't actually know how. Uh, I, I noticed that too. Um, a, a couple of ways we sent out pardon me, a, an email yesterday with a link to a, a very short Google form that you can fill out um, to let us know how many guides you'd like and uh, where your thoughts are on where you'd be uh, distributing them. That uh, A link to that form is also on the homepage. So you can just log on to lwbkc.org. And it's a, a big red button at the top. But you have to be logged in as a member, though. We're only doing this for members. And of course, if you would like to contribute some dollars to the effort to distribute uh, or to print rather the voter guides, please feel free. We will take your money. It cost what three grand roughly? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it does. It costs actually a little bit over three grand when you um, put in the cost of the vote for one. Um, technology so yeah and yeah, that's and not even talking about all of the volunteer hours that's hard cost so yeah 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 and we have a not a huge budget for the year that we work 
with. It's in the neighborhood of ten, twelve thousand dollars, I think, total. Uh, so, also wanted to announce: please subscribe to our YouTube channel. This is something I have to do. I'm going to do this as soon as we're done with the meeting. Uh, if we get a hundred subscribers to the YouTube channel, then we get to make up our own. We get a custom URL. So I, I don't know that we get to make it up, but we get a custom URL. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's that's a social media that I forget about and I haven't actually done that yet. So please do that. And if you all do it now, I'm okay with that. I am totally fine with speaking to you as though you were a bunch of people at dinner. <laughs> Sorry, I use that joke at least twice a month. <laughs> this crowd uh i don't mind uh anyway email becky yaki please if you did not get trained as a voter registration solicitor we trained 80 people over two days <laughs> and so thank you so much for coming to our uh, magical mystery tour and i hope that we demystified some of it on our magical mystery tour uh, but if you did not get trained for some reason and you want to please contact becky we can um we'll talk about getting another training between now and the last day to register um to vote which is october 12th if we have a if we have enough people which is really one right one is enough if we have enough people we'll do another training <laughs> uh probably zoom because we're tired <laughs> um please check i'm gonna have to check these off as i go please check the volunteer page every day from now until the election we are in our busiest season of the year of course um but we will have voter registration trainings up we will have Lots and lots of get out the vote up on our volunteer page. Get out the vote is doing some canvassing. We are doing some, uh, I think, telephone calls. We're doing, oh, just a ton of stuff. And if you've got an idea for get out the vote, it's not too late to get that up and running. Um, we've got people making buttons. We've got people going to the city market. We've got um, other events, we've got uh, volunteers who are planning to go to the Lizzo concert. Um, well, to go outside the Lizzo concert, I should say. And if you have ideas for other concerts, other places we might go, please let us know. We're, we're teaming up with KCUR to do canvassing. Um, there may be some other organizations that we can team up with as well. We are also taking information to tons of different organizations um, on the, the west side to get some information in Spanish to the Hispanic community and to the east side. And we've got some partners that we're working with there, but we need lots and lots and lots of uh, leg, leg work and feet on the ground for that. Um, okay, check us, oh, check, check us out. We made the news. We walked down to, uh, not walked, we drove. We took a couple of cars full of people to Jeff City on Wednesday and walked in a big stack. It was a big, heavy stack of voter solicitation solicitor applications. And we handed them to uh, Jay Ashcroft's assistant and we gave speeches and we hollered and we, shook our signs and then we went for ice cream and it was awesome and some of us one car of us even stopped at the Amish store on the way home and it was pretty darn close to a perfect day just have to say I brought home 25 pounds of tomatoes I'm pretty happy um so check us out you can google uh, actually I'll try to put the link in the chat when I have a second when I'm not talking uh Judy Ann. Thank you, Judy Ann. Judy Ann, just put the link in the chat. So go look at it later if you want. Um, we don't look, uh, we, we don't look uh, too bad. We look like we got something to say. Um, you can now buy a t-shirt on our website. You have to be logged in, but there's a little store picture. And the way it works is that you buy, you pick your size. I'm afraid the 
the fat people sizes are sold out. We'll have to get some more. We'll work on that. Uh, but you pick your size and then you, you pay for it. And then an email goes to our friend, our, our new one of our new members, Lisa, who's here, who's going to wave, sort of. She no, nope, she's gonna poke her screen. Anyway, there she is. <laughs> so the email goes to Lisa. Lisa wraps it up, ties it up with some beautiful raffia, puts a little card in it with your name on it, puts it in a box on her porch, and then you swing by and get it. It is uh, easy peasy, and um, she makes those things look so charming. So it's much better than if it was at my house where I might flop it in the yard and say, oh I, I forgot I threw it in the yard on my way out the door okay speaking of t-shirts we have some great ideas for t-shirts I've had several people come up to me recently and say we should be selling this we should be selling a t-shirt that says that why don't we have a t-shirt with this on it well because we don't have a fundraising chair that's why we don't have any t-shirt sales except for the one t-shirt that we need for marketing purposes so uh i'm going to make another pitch for a fundraising chair and this time i'm going to pitch it differently than i usually do and my pitch is going to be this we don't have any fundraising chair right now so any fundraising chair is better than what we have now and if we had somebody who wanted to come in and just sell t-shirts we would be okay with that if we had somebody who wanted to come in and sell t-shirts with an eye to having a gala in five years actually we would have to think about that because that sounds like a lot of work for everybody <laughs> but but we could probably be talked into it so my point being that the range of need for us for fundraising starts at setting up a little store, the little t-shirt store. That's where it starts so that we can get our name on more t-shirts and a tiny bit of money from each t-shirt. And uh, we have a t-shirt guy already. He's a nice guy. Uh, he'll let you come to his shop and touch his shirts. <laughs> That's what Becky and I did. He'll let you put them on if you want. So anyway, another pitch, please, 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 please. If you have any interest at all, we are in desperate need of a t-shirt vendor slash fundraising chair. Okay. Uh, we have digital and printable fact sheets on our website as I speak. So share those far and wide with your organizations, with your classes, if you're a classroom teacher, with your neighbors, with the people where your mom lives, with the people your dad plays golf with, share those, those fact sheets, please. You can go um, there on the public side. They are, oh, I didn't write down where they are. Pat, can you remind me what page they're on, please? If you're there, Pat. Yes, they're on the uh, helpful resources page, which is in the, <clears throat> pardon me, the our work section. But if you go down to LWB right now on the home page, there's a link to the helpful resources page, and they're at the bottom of the page. That's right. So it's on our home page in the LWB right now. That's the little section that's in the middle. So if you go there, there's a link to where you can get these printables and. Uh, Thank you, many thanks to the team that put those together. That was uh, that it had so many people. I'm not even going to try to name everybody because I would absolutely leave somebody out. But there was a huge team that put that together and did just a fantastic job. So thank you very much. There's all kinds of information and we want to get that out to as many people as possible. Uh, OK, we're halfway through this list. We're not doing too bad. Let's see our first ballot information sessions which are co-sponsored by the public library, the Kansas City Public Library, will be at the Central Library on the evening of Tuesday, September 27th. So that's the first one, Tuesday, September 27th, starting at seven. And then the second presentation will be at the Plaza on Monday evening, October- No, no, Ann. Nope, not seven. Greg is trying to tell you. Six. Thank you, sorry. Starting at six. 
Thank you for that correction. So uh, there, so both of them are at six. Okay. So Tuesday, September 27th at the downtown library and Monday, October 3rd at the Plaza Library. We are really strongly encouraging you guys to come to one or both of those two in particular. We have four altogether, but the other two are, we have one at Blueford and that one's actually our monthly meeting. And so it's coinciding with our monthly meeting. So we know we're gonna have some people there. And um, we will also be canvassing along with KCUR in a couple of weeks before the, in advance of that meeting. So we're gonna walk that neighborhood and invite people personally who live near that library to come to that program. Uh, also Northeast, we're gonna be walking the neighborhoods out around Northeast neighborhood to encourage people to come to those programs. One that's that KCUR is hosting that we are partic participating in and then the ballot measures program. So we really want a great attendance at all of the meetings, uh, all of the ballot measure presentations because we feel that this partnership with the library is very important and we wanna make a, a big showing. So even though it might mean you go twice or even three times, there'll be snacks. So please come, please come to as many as you can. Uh, even if you roll in late, which I might have to do because I, I go back to work next week. So, uh, all right. And let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, that was part of that one. Sorry, I forgot. So Greg says he set up a volunteer opportunity. And so for those ballot measures, so all you have to do is show up. You can bring a friend and wear your LWV pin and then you'll learn about the constitutional amendments coming in the, on this month's, I mean, on this year's ballot. So that's a big deal. It's not just to come and support us. It's also to come and learn about these ballot issues, because I have to tell you, I get phone calls all the time. And every once in a while, somebody says, uh, what is on the ballot? And I say, I, I have no idea. I haven't, I don't know. I haven't gone to that program yet. I don't know. Plus my husband tells me to hope who to vote for. So I don't know. I know I get such a reaction. <laughs> it's just the division of labor. I he does the research. <laughs> How we divide it. Sorry. Uh, Greg, did you have something to add about that? Yeah, two things uh, that were relevant to things people said earlier. Number one, uh, National Voter Registration Day. We actually designed this program with the library because the library wanted something that would be coincident with voter registration day. So if you're looking for something that is relevant to voter registration day, this is where we come out and say, this is what we're doing for it. The second thing is we did have a discussion here about a possible initiative petition, citizens initiative petition on uh, reproductive rights here, this is a good place to get informed on how that works. That's part of this presentation. So it isn't easy to understand. So you can get smart by attending this. Thank you. All right, I wanna mention also our next DEI meeting is Tuesday at seven on Zoom. So please come to that. Uh, there are 10 potential forums in September, October, and November. We're covering races in Jackson, Clay, Cass, and Platte counties at the county legislature or commission level, as well as Missouri Senate and House races by county. Uh, confirmed dates will be found at our website, of course, lwvkc.org, um, under the banner of LWV right now. So that same section where we have a link to the printables. And the, by the way, those are appropriate for digital distribution as well. They're not just printables. So please feel free to email them to people, um, attach them to your, or link them to your social media. They're, you know, they're, they can go out digitally as well. Um, and let's see, we'll have a link at that same place back to the forums. There'll be a link to register for the live stream or a link to the recording if you can't make the, the uh, webinar, the, the forum in person on the date of. 
Uh, we've mentioned it a couple times, but also the last day to register to vote is October 12th. And then I know I, I see some hands up, but uh, the last official announcement I have is about the Adopt a Poll Worker program. And we have, so the Adopt a Poll Worker is, as most of you know, that we have volunteers who will go and work as election judges, which is a, a terribly long day. It's from about five in the morning until about eight o'clock at night. So uh, you have to be super dedicated. But you get paid $275 uh, to work the as a judge, $300 if you're a supervisor. And we have a program where if we have 10 or more people who volunteer as election judges, then we work directly with the board, the Kansas City Board of Elections. Um, and then they will actually donate the entire salary of the, the aggregate of all those salaries, they will actually, instead of paying you, they will donate that to the League of Women Voters. So um, I can't do it. It's I'm barred from doing that because of our bylaws, but I have done it in the past and it's kind of fun and you do get to take some breaks and you get to take a nap and they have you can bring snacks and people feel sorry for you. And if you're lucky, there are a couple of places where they make cookies for you. My friend got to, they fed him donuts in the morning and cookies in the afternoon. My my pull, my polling places have never been that good. But uh, uh, people are really appreciative. The people who come in to vote um, are very, very appreciative. So think about that, please. Uh, there'll be some information in the e-voter. We have to get signed up by September 23rd to participate because we have to do some paperwork that um, Sandy Eads will put together and deliver to the Board of Election on September 27th. So please watch the next e-voter. We have a whole bunch of stuff that's that's already in the queue to go into the next e-voter because that's the one that goes to our members only. So we have um, just a ton of work that we're doing in the next 60 days between now and, and election. And so read your e-voter and uh, keep an eye out. Okay, that's it for my official as the dog barks. So Cheryl, you have your hand up. And you are muted. So you need to unmute for us, please. Is that better? Is that better? Okay. Uh, as you know, I was at Tuesday's uh, training on, you know, for the Secretary of State, and I gave you my my signed statement. Anyway, my question is: Should I be alarmed or concerned that I haven't received a confirmation from the Secretary of State? No, we handed them a huge stack, and that was a little bit part of the design to <laughs> clog that. Uh, process and and make it onerous for them because it's onerous for us. So it it got there, and uh, I know you don't have a, I know you don't have a response yet. I don't either. So okay, it, it'll come. I was just wondering, Becky. Come on. Okay, um, I wanted to announce that I am looking for someone to please. Uh, take over responsibility for arranging voter registrations at colleges and trade schools and universities. I had someone designated to do that and she has decided not to move forward. And I've got like five, at least five or six college events before the October 12th deadline. So um, I think we're good for this year, but you know, moving forward, I would like to delegate that responsibility to someone because with the, the committee this big and so many volunteers, I've just got to let go. So this is part of my letting go. Anybody who is interested in this, it's lots of fun to go to college uh, campuses and uh, talk to the students and they are our future. And as we all know, the younger you are when you start voting, the more likely you're going to be a lifetime voter. And I think that's something we all can agree on as a great thing. So that's my announcement and uh, email me through the website or not if you have any 
any interest in doing that. It's, it is a ton of fun. So that's it, done. Thank you. Yep. Alice? A uh, question for Greg. Greg, where um, online can we find the ballot issues uh, that are currently gonna be on the November ballot, the state and local issues? Yes, the, um, and I, I will follow up with this in an email, but the Secretary of State has on the Secretary of State website, everything that will be on the ballot. And that includes uh, the ballot summary for every one of these things, plus um, the fair ballot language. Um, and actually, Alice has a great question because uh, one of the things that the voter is going to confront um, on election day is that these amendments are going to be very, very, very long. And um, I was talking to somebody that was helping us and he goes, yeah, you know, I, when I go to vote and, you know, I'm in a hurry. And then I said, oh, well, well, it is this stuff at the end. So you got to look. So I will send it out, but it's secretary of state. And I don't I don't want to give bad information, but I will send it out to everyone, the, the link, and that'll make it possible. But a great question. And it will also be in the vote for one one, of course, on October seventeenth as well at vote for one one dot org. Yeah, and and, and Greg, and, we and can I, send that link in the e voter that comes out on the. Okay, well then we'll just look for it in the e voter. But I will also just say, um, don't be surprised at how big all that information is. It's there's just a whole lot, especially the marijuana one. Okay, Brita. Thank you. Greg. I just, I just wanted to go back to um, what Anne was talking about. Adopt a poll. What the the process that she was talking about only exists for the Kansas City Election Board, not yeah. for any other election board. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to clarify that, and also I wanted to say that if you cannot be um, a poll worker, we will accept through the adopt a poll worker. Um, we will accept any donation you want to give from five dollars on up um, in support of these people who do work the polls for us. So um, feel free. It doesn't have to be um, from your working that day. It can be any amount whatsoever. And just hit that donor button up in the right hand corner of the website, and you will see where it says donate for a poll worker. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying and, and adding that too. Thank you. And uh, Greg, just put that link in the chat so you can find the um, ballot issues there. Laura. Yes, I was going to tell everyone how easy it is to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I know we're all getting um, up to date on social media, but we have these five little icons in the upper left of our website and once you're signed in the third icon is the youtube icon and when you click it it goes to our youtube channel and then on the right there's a button that says subscribe and you hit it and you're done so you know we've got plenty of members that we should be able to get to that hundred that hundred people with no problem awesome terry thank you Yes, I just received, because I um, uh, follow the disability things in the state of Missouri, and uh, the Missouri Developmental Disabilities Council just put out a whole explainer on 1878. They linked you to a link I put in for voter ID, and at the bottom of that page, I just put the link in, is a form you can fill out asking the Secretary of State to help you get your photo ID. And I hadn't Good. seen that before. Good. Um, Good. Yeah, the whole thing, are you requesting that? And they actually asked, do you want, is this for an organization? So I'm wondering if they have print materials that we can request. Um, they might. Can yeah. you, have you filled it out? I haven't, but I can. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, let us know. Okay, I'll fill it out. May I fill it out for an organization? Yeah. Okay, will yeah. do. You can fill it out for this organization. Yes, I will fill it out <laughs> yeah. for this organization. 
Uh -oh. um, and speaking of uh, help with ID, uh, we didn't, yeah, we haven't talked about the voter ID thing today, but um, but we are partnering with Vote Writers. We just we just entered a partnership with them, and they help. Their mission is to help people get voter ID, and so they are sending us ten thousand information cards in English and a thousand in Spanish, and so while we're uh, well, we have to dis distribute these earlier than the than the. Um, voter guides, but we're also going to be looking for help. This is part of our get out the vote effort. Um, we'll also be looking for help getting those distributed um, both to organizations and then as part of the packet that we walk around when we canvas um, starting this week with KCUR. So, so that's kind of exciting uh, that we have that coming because I don't think we have a ton of help getting people IDs on this end of the state. So that's a big deal. All right, well, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, social media. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can all see all of our handles. And, and then I'm going to brag. I love when I get to brag. So I'm going to brag because social media has had a campaign that they've been working on for months, several months now, called I Vote Because. Uh, and they've managed to almost teach me how to use a hashtag in social media. Not quite, but almost. And and uh, and not uh, and not necessarily enthusiastically too. I have I've been I've come in a little reluctantly because I'm uh, not as young as I once was, and I'm not a native, but. They have this wonderful program that's called I Vote Because. Um, Rachel and I actually recorded a little video that, uh, talking about why we vote. And so people take pictures or just create posts with the hashtag I Vote Because and then say why they vote. And it's been a, a really great campaign for us. And it's a great way for us to engage people when we're out in the community. Um, we were out on Thursday night at a program at the library we had a table and Judy Ann was there with her camera and we could we could shunt enthusiastic voters her way so that they would talk to her and make an I vote because post but even more exciting the state league of New Mexico contacted Judy Ann earlier this week and said, we love your campaign and we would like to steal it, please. Can we have all your stuff? And we said, well, well by we, I mean, Judy Ann said, well, of course. <laughs> so, uh, so we have just busted out of our own state boundaries with, um, with a wonderful um, social media campaign. So kudos to, to Judy Ann and the entire social media campaign for making that happen. We really appreciate it. It makes us look good. When you look good, we look good. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. That is, that is it. And it looks like we are ending right on time. Unless anybody's got <laughs> oh, one really? more thing they desperately have to talk about. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming to this really, um, really powerful meeting. I hope that um, I hope you'll share the link to this meeting on your social media so that other people can, you know, can see other people who missed it can can see it. I thought it was really great. So thank you for coming, everybody. I just wanted to say I put a link to one of the posts in uh, in the chat. Awesome. All right, thank you.